Uh, good afternoon. Welcome back to Array Festival 2021. Uh, digital tech and innovation in the city of Lancaster. And uh, this afternoon is all about low carbon innovation. So um, three great sessions lined up. We have uh, coming up now, Lena Energy session, and then followed by live stream from, uh, from Vax Joe and uh, a conversation around having a, a clean energy uh, community. And then final session this afternoon is a one-to-one -one interview with uh, Mr. Digital Lancaster himself, uh, Mike Gibson. So really uh, exciting stuff coming up. Really pleased for you to be here. As always, we are on the chat. So if you've got any questions, please uh, pop them in onto the live chat and we can ask uh, throughout the talk. And anyone who's watching live in the audience, if you've got any questions, then we have the mic set up ready for questions as well from the audience. Final reminder as well that if you go into the, uh, the rooms, the networking rooms, Throughout, you'll find our sponsors, ICS Accounting, who are there on hand to chat to people about any of their accounting needs. So um, I'm, that's enough from me, though, I think now. So I'm going to hand over. I'm really thrilled that uh, we've got James here from Lean Energy, uh, battery uh, cell specialist technology that's really evolving in the city region. Uh, and what an exciting time. Uh, Lena is a, a, a name that everyone is starting to recognize and I'm sure we have an incredibly exciting uh, future. So James, thanks for joining us and I'm gonna pass over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here and be able to present after so long. Um, for those expecting our technical director, Richard Dawson, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but my name is uh, James Shaw Stewart. I'm the lead process engineer at Leaner Energy which means I cover um, pretty much all of the cell development work. We, we also get into module and pack development too. Um, and uh, given that we're an SME, I also do various other operational tasks uh, within the company too. Um, so before I get into too much detail, I thought I'd start with a video which uh, explains um, a bit about Leaner Energy that we've made very recently to give you a bit more of a visual uh, guide as well as a, from the horse's mouth. All right. Leaner Energy is developing a solid state sodium battery technology which doesn't include any cobalt or any lithium and it's using a chemistry set which was used many many years ago and what we're doing is, is we're just re-engineering it using modern materials science and modern materials engineering. This is a really good chemistry. It can be used in all sorts of applications, sort of grids, uh, renewable support, electrification of vehicles, all these really big uh, future and becoming really quite current topics, um, which we really need to address as a, as a sort of global community. What excites me about the technology is how beautifully simple it is and how it really does solve a big, big problem that we have in the transition to, to sort of net zero from fossil fuel to full renewables, full electrification. It's in a market that's really growing, so it's something that really excites me because it's different. Everybody's looking at lithium, you know, it's been done to death. This is something that's new, different, and tackles a number of the problems that lithium can't really meet. Um, so that's why it's quite exciting for me. It's a rare opportunity to actually get the chance to design something that, um, that is truly important for, for, for us as human beings for the future. Okay. I hope that video was useful. Certainly a slicker operation than I am at uh, presenting a bit about Lena. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we're mainly a cell development company, but some of you might not be familiar with the term even of differentiating between a cell and a battery. So I thought I'd explain here um, some of the, the real basics of a battery. Um, it's a series of cells, essentially, the, the term of battery. So often if you've got a single cell, it's a bit of a misnomer to call it a battery, and it, it derives from the uh, military, the uh, origin of an artillery battery, um, where you have lots of different guns all firing together, and the, the sum total of that power being much greater than each individual one, because it's all added together, obviously. Um, uh, 
so the the analogy obviously doesn't work completely but a single gun is equivalent to a single cell um, and some of you who are into electronics might be familiar with this this diagram circuit diagram on the side and essentially the two main components of a battery are the two electrodes where you have two different potentials usually given by two different metals or uh, compounds um, and the, the voltage that then goes around the circuit comes from the potential difference between those two electrodes. Um, and the cathode is the positive electrode, the anode is the negative one. And if you want to get into, I remember my, my uh, standard grade physics and GCSE physics, they, they always show the, that going different ways, the electrons go from the positive to the negative, um, but you often draw it the other way around um, in Scotland for some reason. I never quite understood that. Uh, but uh, yeah, in between those two elec uh, electrodes, an absolutely vital part of this electrochemical device is an electrolyte, which means uh, a material that can transport ions conductive, um, conductively, essentially, uh, taking these charged elements or sometimes uh, compounds, usually positive because they're usually metals which are positively charged when they're uh, ions from one electrode to the other. Um, and when you're discharging a battery, um, it will be going from the cathode to the uh, anode. Um, and that's why it's usually the electrons going from positive to negative, but it can be the other way around if you've got different um, charged ions in your, in your uh, battery, essentially. So you can have fluoride ion batteries, uh, for example. Um, a vital part of this as well is a separator which keeps the two electrodes apart. So you, you make sure that you, you don't have electrical conductivity as well as the ionic conductivity between the electrodes. Um, and in normal, battery, normal low temperature lithium alkaline batteries like you have at home, that will be uh, some sort of polymer or a mesh which basically just is dielectric, won't conduct electricity and lets the liquid to pass, uh, pass through with the ions in it which because the electrolyte is liquid. In our battery, this is actually a solid electrolyte, so the electrolyte acts as a separator too and only carries the um, ions through it and no, uh, no electronic transfer takes place. So, at a larger scale, each cell stores a small amount of energy, but added together it, in a battery that can make a very large amount. So, for example, in a Tesla, you have in the region of 11,000 cells in, in the uh, um, the 70 kilowatt hour batteries that are in the model s uh, or is it 90 kilowatt hour batteries in the model s so it's a lot of cells in there um, and they'll be added in series or in parallel in series makes is like in the circuit diagram increases the voltage so you add on the voltage with each cell that's in series and if they're in parallel you increase the capacity but either way both adding each battery each uh, each cell increases the battery by the energy component within each cell so they're termed electrochemical devices because the energy is stored and released by ions reacting chemically at the electrodes. So in each electrode you have the ion come across, it reacts and releases an electron which then goes around your, your electronic circuit. Um, these processes are known as charging and discharging the batteries. Most batteries that we use day to day are what are termed primary batteries which means you can't charge them up. Um, the, the technical term for some reason is secondary battery for rechargeable batteries and that they're obviously what are getting all the, the headlines at the moment as we're moving towards this more um, uh, wireless type uh, world and much more electron, uh, electricity driven uh, devices and the batteries are getting bigger and bigger, they have to be rechargeable. So batteries are starting to enable these mega trends as uh, they're termed here of decarbonisation and uh, of energy and the electrification of transport in particular. And so these numbers here on the, on the um, right uh, are forecasts for 2030 where the, the grid energy storage alone um, market is pr uh, predicted to be in the region of 40 billion US dollars, uh, totaling 741 gigawatt hours of, um, of batteries, which is a lot of batteries if you consider that the Sunderland Nissan plant uh, outputs two gigawatt hours of battery at most per year um, and these batteries probably won't last uh, much more than 10 years although obviously we try and make them as last as long as possible um, and 
With electric vehicles, it's likely to be even double that, depending on how fast the, the uh, electrification of transport takes place, um, with even more astronomical numbers of capacity, because obviously when you're driving a vehicle, you're often even more nervous about running out of capacity, so there's probably going to be a lot of excess capacity in, in um, battery, uh, EV batteries, electronic, uh, electric vehicle batteries. So coming back to Lena, we are working on uh, a new type of battery, which actually is derived from very old um, research, or well, very old in the, the context of modern electronics uh, research in this field. So back in, it actually goes back even beyond the beginning of this timeline, which starts at 1980. In the 1970s, there was a, um, uh, a research institute in South Africa, I think it's called CSIR, was very uh, forward looking at what technologies were on the horizon and decided to research into batteries in particular. Um, and they worked on lithium ion as well as uh, sodium batteries and various other ones as well. But the, the one they really tried to commercialize um, was this, uh, what's known as a sodium metal chloride uh, chemistry. And it get, got nicknamed the Zebra Battery because that was the name of the whole project, the Zeolite Battery Research Africa. And it was quite a nice, neat acronym. Um, so uh, that name, the Zebra Battery, is stuck through uh, the last uh, 40 years now and is still often referred to when you're looking through uh, literature on secondary battery options. Um, and this, there was a big commercialization push. You can see on the left, it was AEG, the big, America, uh, big German uh, company, uh, in, in collaboration with Anglo-American, were working on this. Um, then they, they sold this um, in the, at the turn of the century to uh, GE, and they, they invested over 100 million in Zebra batteries as well, but the timing just wasn't quite right for it in America. And now it's uh, GE have sold the technology over to um, uh, to China. There's there's quite a, there's a lot of other stuff going on at the bottom, and there is still a very much commercial operation of these old Zebra batteries in Central Europe, actually, which is kind of an offshoot of those these big companies uh, in North Italy and in Switzerland, uh, which is um, which, which seems to be to, uh, going along quite nicely uh, and probably growing quite significantly at the moment. But they use a very different approach than what we do. So right on the far right, in 2017, Lena started uh, um, incubated within Lancaster University um, with a core patent from our technical director, Richard Dawson, um, looking at an innovative re-engineering of this proven, because it is proven, sodium nickel chloride chemistry. It's, I said sodium metal chloride before because it can be different metals other than nickel. Um, but uh, we're focusing on nickel at the moment uh, to start off with at least. And this has huge potential w w because of the wider problems with the limited um, lithium resources, me uh, resor the materials resources for the batteries and various other issues with lithium ion uh, batteries become apparent, meaning that certain applications aren't quite as feasible as people might have imagined. So the original Zebra battery shown on the left, in white is, is what I called the solid uh, electrolyte that I mentioned before that separates the two electrodes. The blue is one electrode and the gray is the other electrode. Um, and that in the Zebra battery is a, is a very thick um, ceramic tube. Uh, it's, it's quite bulky um, with a poor uh, relative to lithium ion, at least, uh, storage to weight volume uh, or volume um, density. So that this is often quite an important metric, particularly for mobile applications like electric vehicles. It's very expensive, particularly that ceramic um, tube because of the material it's made of and the thickness of it and the, the height, so the cost of the material and the temperature it has to be uh, heated to, to, to be formed. And Therefore, it's only really suited to uh, very niche applications um, because of A, the cost, and B, uh, some limitations of the design. Um, with our new de design, we are hoping to take this old cell design with the same chemistry, different materials for the electrolyte, uh, and make it much more competitive to lithium ion, um, ideally above it. So with an ultra-thin planar design, uh, 
max, maximizing the, the, the storage, uh, the energy density in terms of weight and volume, um, using lower cost materials and processing for that electrolyte. So you can see the ceramic is uh, coated on the steel, which enables it to be a much thinner, much higher power densities um, than for the, each individual cell. So you can get more um, current out for each individual cell. So for a smaller battery, you'd be able to get better power out. Um, and so it's got potential in both EV and grid storage. So to summarize, it's an, uh, the IP, the intellectual property that Lena is generating is an innovative re-engineering of proven chemistry and not an attempt to prove new chemistry. So I've got quite a few cells that I'm going to go through quite fast. Um, there's a lot of information on them, but uh, it's, it's, it's just justifying and demonstrating how uh, Lena's cell can compete with uh, lithium ion and actually surpass it in many, many areas. So it's non-flammable inorganic materials internally. That's very different to lithium ion, which is definitely flammable and, uh, uh, and actually self, um, it provides oxygen for its own flames. So it's very hard to put out lithium ion fires. Um, central to that design is that solid state uh, electrolyte layer. Um, and unlike other sodium ions, so you might confuse uh, Lena's technology with what's called so sodium ion batteries. Sodium ion really describes a uh, structure that's very similar to lithium ion where you have um, uh, a certain type of cathode and a certain type of anode and, and uh, a liquid electrolyte in between. So it's a low temperature sodium battery. This is very different technology with the solid state uh, uh, electrolyte in between. Um, so it overcomes various uh, materials limitations experienced by other chemi chemistries. The main one being that all of the materials used in uh, the Lena cell are, are commonly uh, accessible and, and not toxic. Uh, the most toxic itself being uh, nickel, which is definitely, which is often at the bottom of the pile when it comes to looking at lithium ion components. So the IP is protected by a number of patents, four co core patents now, uh, produced all in the last four years, ranging from the cell all the way up to the pack design now. But, uh, because as I'll explain later, the pack design is an important part of demonstrating this technology. So we're targeting $50 kilo, uh, dollars per kilowatt hour, which is considerably lower than where lithium ion uh, stand at the moment. And the, the final cells are cobalt and lithium free, uh, which are often the cobalt in particular, one of the main um, issues with the most high performing lithium ion batteries, uh, reliably sourcing that material. Um, and here you can see our schematic of uh, the module, uh, a module at the bottom plugging into a pack with the thermal insulation around the outside. Uh, so just to compare it with lithium ion and a number of features, it is at least as good, if not uh, better potentially than lithium ion, both in, term in terms of performance, the cost and risk, uh, um, and in particularly safety, where lithium ion has a lot of issues and uh, Lena, Lena's technology um, has a lot of advantages, which I'll come to explain in a minute. And then finally, the, the chemistry has at least as long, in fact, longer track record than uh, lithium ion um, when you go back to the 1970s. So it's already proven and tested in numerous different settings. So one of the big uh, issues about this, um, this technology is that it operates at higher temperatures, 160 degrees to 300 degrees. That can be seen at first as a disadvantage, but in fact, we argue is a, a distinct advantage given the, the issues that lithium ion uh, technologies have with thermal management because these high temperatures mean you've got a single problem to solve rather than a cooling and a heating problem as low temperature batteries do. Um, so that's partly why we have the, the, why I explained the insulation is so important around the outside uh, um, that you can see colored in green in these, in these uh, schematics. So it stays at temperature for roughly two days because of the quality of the insulation we're using with no heating after use. use so you can leave your car uh, confident that it will turn back on very quickly uh, straight away if it's got a Lena module or pack inside. Um, and you can use the pack charge to keep the temperature up if you want to keep it uh, available for a longer. And 
there will be a, what's sometimes known as a vampire current with that, but there is with all types of batteries, as I'll explain later on uh, in EVs as well. So this is uh, comparing um, lithium ion on the left with um, our uh, Lena sodium nickel chloride uh, technology on the right. Temperature is on the, the vertical axis and across the horizontal axis is time, just showing what happened, how fast the, uh, um, uh, the temperature will change during, well, how much the temperature changes during operation. So with um, lithium ion batteries, they have lots of issues trying to keep the temperature below 45 degrees Celsius when it's under operation. And so there's a lot of effort put into the, the process of removing heat from these batteries or making it so that the heat never gets generated in the first place. Whereas with our technology, because we're operating at the higher temperatures, the, the amount of heat being generated by a cell, as well as the, it being smaller because of the, the differences in the chemistry, it's much easier if the cells are pushed very hard. So when there's high power, you will get some heating up for, for heat to be removed from a very high temperature battery than it will be from a, from a low temperature battery, as you can see on the right, because ambient temperature will be much lower around about your, your pack. So it, as I mentioned, it, it requires minimal cooling. So as the, the problem really becomes a problem of heating, whereas when, it become, where, when you're looking at lithium ion pack on the left, you've got to remove heat at different types, and then you've got to add heat at other times. Uh, the one thing that's not very well known about lithium ion batteries, but particularly standard technologies, but even the latest ones struggle to operate successfully below zero degrees Celsius with long lifetimes. It's the, and not just operating, even storing the lithium ion batteries below zero degrees Celsius will, will reduce the lifetime of your battery considerably. Um, not, it won't be noticeable, it'll just reduce the capacity and you'll realize it when you try and turn on your, your drill for 20 minutes and it, do, and it does it doesn't work. five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, the, the, um, this is the, the slide showing the, the phantom, I called it the vampire drain before, the phantom drain from uh, lithium ion battery EVs is just as much uh, as the drain that would be used in a Lena pack just to keep the, the temperature up because of the quality of the insulation in a Lena pack, because there are plenty of um, other uh, parameters that need to be controlled to optimize the lifetime of a lithium ion battery as well as uh, just keeping your, your pack. You can't, it, it never stays stable. It's a liquid electrolyte, so there's always reactions that can go on with lithium ion battery. Um, one of the big advantages, so because of this high temperature operation, lithium ion uh, batteries obviously have disadvantages. They need to be designed for the climate, whereas Lena's batch technology will be just as usable in both technologies. You'll still get more use uh, drain from the battery for things like HVAC, the heating and uh, cool it, uh, cooling within your battery when it's cold uh, in a car, because car, you always want to be warm in your car. Uh, but the, 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 purport, the problems for the battery are always going to be the same. It's just keeping it at above 160 degrees Celsius. Um, the main advantage, I would say, of uh, uh, Lena's sodium nickel chloride uh, technology, though, is safety. So lithium ion batteries have a lot of safety issues. You will have seen fires and things like that that uh, um, get a lot of coverage. There's a lot of ways of mitigating that with lithium ion batteries, but they inherently are difficult to transport because when they're alive, they're very high voltage uh, batteries. You can't turn off a lithium ion battery. It is always, those contacts are always going to be live and you can't discharge it without destroying the battery. Whereas there are look, people looking at maybe cooling it down to liquid nitrogen temperatures to transport lithium ion batteries safely. But because Lena's type battery operates at high temperatures, just transporting it at room temperature means that everything is frozen and there is no risk of even short circuiting or you know, getting arcing uh, damage to people operating it. So transporting this sort of battery will be a, is a lot uh, safer than transporting lithium ion batteries. Um, the cost uh, element of Lith Lena's battery technology is also potentially competitive with lithium ion. $86 per kilowatt hour is very low compared to, start, but that is where lithium ion batteries have got to now. 
Um, but if you look at the, that, that, those bars on the left are the total cell cost, the bars, the second one along is just the materials. And you can see nearly all of that 86, so $68 uh, dollars of that $86 is in the materials. Uh, and that is what limits battery cost, is just the materials cost, the raw material cost going into those batteries. And the, the, it is a very difficult uh, floor to, to reduce. Uh, the only way is through improved recycling and uh, improved uh, mineral extraction as well. Um, but with, uh, with this sodium nickel chloride technology, the, the raw material costs are inherently lower. There are processing costs which can be more tricky, uh, uh, around about the electrolyte, for example, but the electrolyte um, uh, generation in lithium ion is just as hard as you can see in the prices here. Uh, the only thing which is higher cost for, uh, for the Lena's battery is the housing because of the thermal management, keeping all the, the um, insulation is, is much greater in general. Um, but the, the cost, the complexity of the thermal management is not as complex as with uh, lithium ion batteries. So to summarise, um, Lena's technology uses abundant raw materials. Uh, it's cobalt and lithium free, as I mentioned before. It reduces supply chain risk and the environmental impact of the battery. Um, here's a quote uh, uh, regarding um, the, the scarcity of some of these, these materials. To replace all UK vehicles with EVs would require tw twice the world's cobalt production, the entire world's production of neodymium, three quarters of the world's lithium production and half of the world's copper production during 2018. Those production values may be increasable, but you can see the scale is enormous and the challenge is, is, is very big for lithium ion to be able to meet the demands that are being put upon it already. Um, so the, this, this is a, and it's not just to do with the, the quantity, it's also to do with locations. So if you look at lithium ion uh, components that are mentioned here, lithium uh, is very focused on Chile. Other countries are starting to do a lot more lithium production from brine, for example, but there's still only a limited amount of lithium in brine. Uh, cobalt is, is heavily dependent on the DRC, which all sorts of issues around being uh, reliant on, on a country uh, like the DRC. Um, but even if you look at other components like graphite, graphite is about 60% coming from China. So there's other geopolitical risks with various materials in lithium-ion batteries. Um, Lina has no critical raw materials. So nickel isn't termed a critical raw material at all. Um, the components are just sodium chloride, stainless steel, nickel, and this salt, which is a mixture of sodium chloride and aluminium chloride, sodium aluminium chloride at the bottom. Um, so big advantages there. It will accelerate global efforts, to, our technology will accelerate global efforts towards net zero, which is becoming a universal target. It's just a matter of when. Um, so we believe our technology can save four and a half billion tonnes of CO2 per year by 2050. Uh, there's long life cycle. Uh, we're looking at easily matching lithium ion battery standard life cycles of 5,000 plus. That roughly correlates to um, eight to ten years if, in terms of a battery, uh, EV battery. Um, it obviously depends on various different things. Lowest cradle to grave CO2 emissions. Uh, we, we've uh, commenced LCA life cycle analysis and our, uh, to compare our technology and our processes with uh, lithium ion ones. Um, we want to enable renewable energy, so working with uh, stationary, uh, stationary storage. Um, uh, uh, developers that work with uh, big renewable energy um, schemes like uh, solar plants, uh, sol solar array fields and uh, wind, wind farms. And it, we see a lot of potential for our technology in the electrification of heavy transport in particular, potentially in light EVs, but this, we, we offer a unique uh, um, economy of scale opportunity over lithium ion batteries with uh, um, HGVs, for example, and buses, where lithium ion does have some problems getting into the market. So we've made various uh, progress with funding. Um, lots, the, we were only incorporated back in 2017, 
so uh, less than four years ago. First patent was filed straight after. The spin-out terms were agreed with Lancaster uh, at the beginning of 2018. And then the first seed funding was, was less than three years ago in 2018. And we've gone from there through a UK Faraday grant um, uh, and our lab being established in the incubation space at the chemistry department at Lancaster University through demonstrating our working cell a second grant from uh, the Bayes department in uh, the government, a second seed funding round, and then various uh, expert advisors and new board appointees over the last year, as we've made a big push to, uh, to increase our investment and moved out of the university in particular here to White Cross, right next to where I'm talking to you from, Dan, or talking to the camera. Just 100 yards away. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. so we're up in what's known as, well, what's called Sharps Sharp. Mill, um, just about 100 metres uh, over in that direction behind the camera. Uh, so now, a final video uh, about what it's like to work at Lena. What's it like to work for Lena Energy? It doesn't feel really like a job in a weird way. You know, we, we started this, there was a few of us as founders, um, it was this wonderful idea, um, and it's really just kind of snowballed from there. And I think what's really quite amazing is only six months or so ago, we were in a small lab in university, now we've got this beautiful facility up in Lancaster, the team of 20 people, there's this sort of wonderful energy. I really enjoy working in a startup environment. Um, working for something that's really different, really interesting, really dynamic. So it keeps you on the toes, there's plenty to be doing, plenty of stuff to be tackling, and it's really interesting. The biggest motivation is the bigger picture perspective that where we're working on a technology that benefits both the local area in terms of bringing a new technology and creating jobs, but also the world at large at providing this, this brand new technology with uh, with materials that are sustainable and much easier to obtain than existing technologies for applications which are growing at rates which the current technologies can't keep up with. Working for Lena, it can be challenging at times, but it's definitely a very rewarding and interesting experience. What's great about working for Lena is the real sense of collaboration we have here. The team is working together all the time towards this one really important goal. For me, the real emphasis on personal development is extraordinary and not something I've seen before. And it just makes it a real pleasure to work here. Working for Lena Energy has been a real joy. Uh, it's a pleasure to come to work every day. I have made some good friends here and uh, hopefully stay here for a long time. It's just exciting to be part of something that makes a difference to the world. It's great fun to work with a bunch of people who are really engaged, enthusiastic and passionate about what they do. In my career I've noticed that a lot of leaders tend to surround themselves with yes men and people that they can not be threatened by. We've deliberately chosen like the opposite approach. It's like we, we like to surround ourselves with people who are brighter and more dynamic and innovative than we are. So it means the place has got a much better chance of making it. Everybody is involved, everybody gets their hands dirty and there's, it's just such an amount of, of clever people that it keeps you on your toes. People at Lena are really quite special, I think, in the way that they're, they're totally engaged in what they're doing, the, the technology, and they believe um, that this is, is something that's going to be very special. So what's it like to work for? It feels really quite a special thing. What a, uh, well, I'm sure you'll agree. I mean, just incredible technology there and uh, from, just sublime to know that that is going on right here in the city region. If you're watching live, please do use the chat to ask any questions. Thanks so much for that, James. I mean, it was a really incredible insight there. Um, we've got someone as well from the audience already who would like to engage in a, a quick question. So I'm going to invite uh, Martin over to come and ask uh, a question now, if that's all right, Martin. Yeah, of course, super. James, firstly, thank you so much. So exciting to have mm -hmm. such great innovation on our doorstep. As, as a company, um, obviously heavily focused on 
uh, R&D research stuff. Whereabouts are you as a company between that, kind of bridging that gap between R&D and commercialization? Oh, thanks, Martin. Yeah, good question. Um, we've, I, I didn't go into detail about it, but we, we've got those, we've had those uh, uh, grants from the government. And as part of the, the first grant, we had to demonstrate, or we did demonstrate, what's known as technology readiness level three, which uh, I can't actually remember what it describes exactly, but it is basically just proving the principle that uh, that the, the chemistry works and that we could get a cell that cycles um, and you can get energy in and out of it, but not much more. But as part of the second one, we, had, we demonstrated uh, technology re readiness level five, which is showing um, the, the functionality of it being reliable and uh, we did it as part as a demonstrator with three different cells together and in fact we've got an article on the website that you can see about where we are or what we demonstrated with that uh, um, uh, prototype which ran um, in January this year um, and now we're we're looking with those those module and those pack uh, schematics you saw there we're starting to work to get towards building those in the next uh, year. So we've got a two year plan by the end of which we hope to build a 50 kilowatt hour demonstrator. Uh, and at that point, we'll look, we'll, we, in order to build that 50 kilowatt hour demonstrator, we will have, we will have uh, produced a few thousand uh, cells in the process. So we will hopefully be at what's known as pilot scale production by then. Um, so that's, that's looking forward into 2023, uh, reaching that level. So things are going quite fast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. And is, uh, so James, what, what sort of, um, you've mentioned electrical, ve electrical vehicles, is that the kind of, is that where you see the sort of initial use cases for this? Or? Well, I, I suppose I could mention about the, the partners that we used in the, those projects. Who, yeah, what yeah, sort so, of? So in the first project, there wasn't any end user partners, but in the, the latest project, which, which finished in January and February, uh, we were partnered with a, a uh, sort of a, a, dem a developer for um, for stationary storage. So they they were looking for new technologies to be used uh, uh, in various different stationary applications. So they they see a lot of potential for the large uh, scale batteries that you might have linked to wind farms or linked to charging points or very like where you need some sort of balancing out of the of some irregular load or supply, supply yeah, yeah. Of, of energy. And so the, the, there's various different grid scale locations where you might not be so limited by energy density and you really want just reliability, longevity. Uh, yeah, so the sorts of things that aren't as important, well, they might be just as important for lithium ion, I mean, for electric vehicles, but in particular, it's the density that isn't such a big requirement. Uh, which is off and, and the ability to scale much more easily, which lithium ion becomes a bit more complex when you're really trying to scale up to the megawatt hour sort of uh, range, which is what a lot of these larger units are. Yeah. Uh, this is absolutely, I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And knowing that we've, th th this is happening right here in the city, and I think, you know, we could ask you so much more about the relationship with the university that you've mentioned. I mean, it sounds to me like it's really on the on the cusp of something that can be incredibly huge. Well, I, sh I should actually also mention there wasn't the, we've got another partner for a future project, so we just successful uh, that we might be working with together, uh, down based down in Lytham called um, Helical, and they they uh, uh, they're looking to 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 try and electrify their business. They've got a supercar uh, project. Um, and our battery technology, we hope to sort of develop with their expertise in actuator uh, manufacture and uh, um, an exhaust manufacture, which is what they do, and, and hopefully look at uh, using them as an end user demonstrator as well. So Sharpsmill, Lancaster University Sharpsmill, we're probably looking at the whole industrial estate soon, are we, for, uh, to, <laughs> to really start moving forward? Well, yeah, we, we, we've built a, a chemistry lab up there, and there's, there's still a lot of space there for another lab, but with that should be being built in the next uh, next few months. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, we, I'm, I'm afraid we've uh, come up, I'm running out of time now and coming up to the end of the session, but I mean, it's just incredible and really exciting, I think, that to see this, to hear about what's happening with the technology and uh, 
And I'm sure it's just a matter of time before we hear some really big news coming out at, uh, at what this is going to do. So um, thank you, everybody, again for, 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 for watching, for tuning in, and uh, keep in touch. Keep watching now. We're going to go shortly to the next session uh, for where we're doing the live stream with our friends in Sweden, in Vaxjo, and then the interview with uh, Mike Gibson. But uh, for now, for the Lean Energy case study, James, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.